And uh, without further ado, uh, a biohacker since 2019, JJ Hastings co-founded. 2009. Oh, damn. I'm, I'm really bad. All right. A biohacker since 2009. I won't forget it now. JJ Hastings co-founded London Biohack Space and Bioquisitive and has the first garage to be PC1 certified in Australia. An alumna of NYU, Harvard, and Oxford with advanced degrees in biology and bioinformatics, she is an analog astronaut and field researcher for NASA and JPL. Without further ado, JJ Hastings. Thank you. Hey. I know I've got the tough like after lunch spot, so I appreciate your enthusiasm, and I'll try and keep the energy up for it as well for my own sake. But g'day. I'm flying all the way over from Melbourne, Australia. I know I've got an American accent, Native American, but <laughs> authentically American, but um, have since been a transplant down to Melbourne since 2016. Um, so first I'd like to start with something that I have learned to become quite precious of, especially since moving to Australia, which is an acknowledgement of country. So recognizing the traditional owners of this particular land that we're sitting on and the deep history and connection that they have, and particularly the people, the Paiute people here of uh, Southern Nevada who have connections throughout uh, the Western Rockies. So a little bit about myself. I've been asked so many different times how to describe who I am, what I do, and uh, frankly, all I can really come down to is that I'm an extremophile. Um, I do so many different things that really it's like trying to have someone pull out a Swiss Army knife. Uh, so really what I try and do is categorize it by what I do, which is biohacking since 2009. Um, I'm a tissue engineer by training, a scientific uh, tissue engineer. I have affiliations and a proper uh, tissue engineering lab. Um, I am a bioinformatician. I studied bioinformatics at Harvard back in 2010, so old fucking school bioinformatician. Um, I am also now an analog astronaut, so I'm going to talk to you today about my experience going into this sort of uh, space training environment um, as a biohacker and the lessons I've learned because I think it's important for all of us as we enter an, into an era of, uh, of commercialized and civ uh, civilian space exploration to really think very carefully about the sort of visions that we have for space exploration going forward. So as was mentioned, I have the very first PC1 certified home lab in Australia. This is my garage. Uh, yay, more people coming in. Um, so what PC1 means is, in Australia we have a different sort of understanding and value system around GMOs. Um, we're not as concerned, per se, with human tissue versus insect tissue versus bacteria. But what we are concerned with is containment of any genetically modified organisms, as in intentionally modified. So we are focused on biosafety and biosecurity of containing GMOs um, and fully testing them for up to 10 years before environmentally releasing them at all, if ever. So what I have obtained for my home garage lab is PC1 or entry level containment uh, certification so that I can work with uh, GMOs at home, which is very, very rare. Um, but it's also meant that I have a very close relationship with many of the um, leadership um, within the re regulatory body, the ODTR in Australia. So what do I do? Well, since 2009, I do a lot of different crazy things using my own body as a source material and the sort of subject of my studies. Um, frequently drawing blood from my own body because I find it actually much more ethically comfortable to use my own body as subject rather than other people's bodies. Um, I also have been experimenting with different implants um, probably for about three years now. Um, though definitely not as advanced as some of the other people in this room, I do um, appreciate very much the, the work of grinders. What do I do with this blood? Well, I'm also a trained artist. One of the things that wasn't mentioned in my bio is that I am a trained artist from St. Martin's in London. Um, I have used my blood to create other materials such as glass and glazes, and on the far left-hand side is a photographic print that I created using albumin from my blood. So I isolated the serum albumin and then added silver nitrate, exposed that, and developed it as a photograph, and that is a photograph of a heart. 
Uh, so I routinely draw substantial amounts of my own blood to intermix and utilize in this artwork, but I also have um, a desire to, to understand how machines and our bodies are becoming much more closely um, intimate. Um, not just data, but actually physically more intimate. Um, in this case, this is an artwork that I created where it's a plant uh, with uh, that is connected to the cloud as I share my stories with uh, the, the components that are embedded within the plant. Uh, it goes up to the cloud. Um, an RNN, a recurrent neural net, uh, then reads my stories and recapitulates them into its own stories and then can share their own stories with others. So it's a way of creating material archive, my blood nurturing the plant, the plant protecting uh, my stories, and the machine creating its own stories based on that ecosystem. Um, another machine that I've developed this year and has been on tour around the world in different galleries um, is a project called the Demiurge. I had my whole genome sequenced in 2016, not just the VCF files that you might get from 23andMe, but my whole genome sequence um, stored on a hard drive, 186 gigabytes of data. Um, and programmed what I'll call a machine. I won't quite call it an AI, because it's, it's not quite the same flavor of what you might consider um, the study of AI, but certainly creative machines. Um, this particular algorithm that I've coded and given the capacity to look through my genome, identify any potentially harmful mutations. So it's taken all publicly available data from GWAS studies, gen genome-wide association studies, um, studies my genome and tells me what it thinks based on those risk profiles it's um, been exposed to, what I should fix, and then generates gRNA sequences to provide to CRISPR that I can then inject back into my body and modify my genome to correct those errors. Now let's return to the topic of space. Oddly enough, I, had, I, I was always a geek, right? Who, who isn't a geek for space, right? Raise your hand, geek for space. Yeah, I'm assuming if you're in this room, you're in some way a geek for space, right? I was the girl that put her Barbies um, into uh, rocket ships. <laughs> um, I was the girl that memorized the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo missions um, rather than you know whoever was in Tiger Beat. So I've just been a space nerd my whole life, but I never, ever thought I would ever have an actual chance to contribute personally towards space exploration. So it was a huge shock to me to be, uh, to find myself in the past few years uh, growing into a uh, capacity of actually working within the space industry context. And I'll start with uh, my field research in Northwest Victoria, um, which is now going to be expanding out into um, a vast inner basin um, in interior Australia of doing metagenomic studies in partnership with NASA JPL and Gene Lab, as well as my partners at Cornell. Um, where, where I'm studying the, these hypersaline lakes that are really far isolated lakes within interior Australia. But what I love is that I get to build amazing tools, um, including Priscilla, my queen of the desert, who will be coming out to uh, the desert with me to take samples um, and help do environmental monitoring of these hypersaline uh, lakes out in the middle of Australia. And last year, oddly enough, I was invited to go on what's called an analog space mission. Kind of curious because I, I really had no real understanding of it before I got into it. Has anyone heard of analog space missions? Anyone? Well, you guys probably don't count because you know me. <laughs> but anyone who doesn't know me, have, has anyone heard of what an analog space mission is? Anyone want to hazard a guess of what an analog space mission might do? Yeah, yeah. Yep, exactly like biosphere, yet a contain, contain space. Um, what sort of stuff do you think we do in that? No, yeah, exactly, try not to go crazy. Yeah, so we have different analogs that are essentially meant to be scenarios, and we do either low fidelity or high fidelity, high fi, low fi uh, missions where we attempt to simulate as best as we can the conditions and um, aims that we might have off Earth. Well, last July, I was asked to be a mission specialist, bioengineer, for this mission, Lunaris, um, in, in a habitat in Poland. This is my crew, my lovely crew. Spent two weeks together in full containment. Um, when I say full containment, I mean uh, no outside air, no outside light, 
Um, no outside communications. We, we were throttled six minutes because we were meant to be on the moon. Um, uh, water rationing, um, light uh, conditioning, as in uh, no UV light except for a single UV light source that we would use for 20 minutes a day, um, and uh, severe water restrictions. So uh, hygiene was particularly an issue. Uh, this is the base, and I want to kind of highlight it because it's an interesting space in its own right with an interesting history. Uh, this is set in Piwa, Poland. And it's called Lunar Station, um, and it was intentionally built to simulate the physical conditions of a lunar base, constructed in 2017 on a former military base in Piwa, Poland. Now, mind you, this is an old Soviet-era uh, base, they essentially decommissioned the entire base and then left it open. Imagine if you were a hacker, you could have essentially requested one of these hangars, old bomber hangars, um, and converted it into your own space. Um, our neighbors and other hangars were doing car mods. <laughs> Some were doing really sophisticated sound systems. Another was doing... Um, Gosh, I uh, was doing parachute jumping or other um, aeronautical training uh, out on the um, uh, the runway. They now had a racetrack. <laughs> so it was an interesting environment. Uh, but one of these hangars was set aside to become this lunar um, analog station, a research station that was custom built specifically for training astronauts and conducting research sponsored by different agencies like ESA um, that would help inform future missions. So in this particular base, uh, when we were in this mission, it, it's since been augmented, but when we were in it, we had a kitchen, we had a garden bio lab, and the garden bio lab was essentially my domain. I was responsible for the care of the hydroponic garden and running all of the experiments out of the bio lab. Um, we had a hygiene module, which is our, our toilet and shower. Um, we had the analytical lab, where we uh, ran uh, basic biometric studies, um, followed the crew health. Um, storage area is pretty self-explanatory. You've got to have everything that you need for two weeks. Communication control room, um, really important for keeping apprised of mission tasks. Sleeping quarters, which were a lot like kind of um, the, the module hotels that you would have in Japan, sleeping in your own little module um, that you could close the curtain on. Um, but then here is the airlock. Now, the airlock takes you out into the hangar, and the hangar is fully enclosed. So there's no natural light, completely dark, fully enclosed, um, and quite, quite um, a sort of oppressive feel to it, very stale air as you go out. Um, but in order to be full sim, you must go through the airlock. You must go into the airlock for decompression, recompression uh, stages, and you must be in full EVA suit, extravehicular um, activity suit, so your exosuit that you would normally take out onto the crater. And they had built a crater within the hangar that we could test out rovers, we could carry out EVA activity um, out on that crater. Just a few little photos of inside of the station. Um, so we've got the atrium in the middle that kind of is the common space. I used to love sleeping out there underneath the atrium at night rather than my, my little uh, bed module. Uh, so we had different contained um, tools for doing um, uh, volatile chemistry. Uh, the kitchen was rather interesting because right above the dining room uh, table was our sole UV light source. So as we were having lunch, we would have our single dose of UV radiation for the day. Now, I was responsible for doing uh, biological experiments on the mission as bioengineer. Um, I would do microgravity simulation, especially with seeds. I was interested in studying how they might grow under microgravity. Um, did metagenomic studies, so following how microbial population shifts um, within the crew as well as the habitat itself uh, throughout the duration of two weeks and six crew members. Um, I was particularly interested, this was my own research, I'm interested in how to produce within a contained environment completely off Earth a regenerative source of hydrogel material that can be multimodal. So providing many different functions or serving many different functions um, within the, the space environment. Um, so this is something I'm going to cover in the hydrogel workshop. Uh, I believe that's taking place 30 minutes after this talk. Um, 
but we'll talk a little bit more about the hydrogels that I've been studying because they're all plant-based and all regenerative, and they are all multimodal. Uh, I was actually really impressed with how resilient and how eager the plants were to grow. I was able to get growth within two days, the first sprouts in two days. That really amazed me, just how eager life seemed to thrive, even in this seemingly harsh environment. But then I want to turn uh, to more of what I discovered um, during this mission, and I'll just say quickly, while I can't disclose the full details now, uh, I will be commanding my own mission, an all-female crew of six on a Mars analog uh, that's going to be hopefully rather high profile coming up in January of next year. So if you want more details, please come talk to me afterwards, and also please stay tuned. But I want to share some lessons that I, I learned from this space environment. One is that um, the future is no longer meant, the space environment is no longer meant for PhDs and former fighter pilots. Those days are gone, really. Um, the legacy astronauts and cosmonauts are not the best candidates for living off Earth. Think miners, sailors, and hackers. Um, and no more running tasks from mission control because you've got a 20 minute delay uh, if you're on Mars, six minutes if you're on the moon. So you've got to be completely autonomous and it's a psychological rather than physical game. So really it's endurance and grit that are the, um, the qualities that you're looking for in a candidate over strength or expertise, which we would have seen in the missions that have led up to the current, current day. Finally, no more sterile tin cans planted in the ground. Those are also gone. No more tin cans. No more docks and tin cans. That's the lesson I'm teaching today. We need to take as much of Earth with us as possible. So no more just humans and tin cans, but multi-species uh, containment contained spaces. Um, but we also need to leave everything that we've ever expected out of life on Earth behind as well. We need to become extraterrestrial in every way. And we don't need to change our environment around us. We don't need to geoengineer Mars. We need to change ourselves. Engineering has to come from the inside, not from the outside. So I'm going to ask some questions to you. Um, and if you want, you can raise your hand, but I, I don't want anyone to feel called out by these. <laughs> Do you spend most of your time indoors under fluorescent light with recycled air? Uh, Do you sleep at odd hours? Can you work for 36 to 48 hours without sleep? Do you eat or drink pretty much the same thing every day? Do you work remotely or spend most of your time with only a few people ever? Ever. Uh, do you wash your clothes only once per week? Uh, do you take a shower every one to two weeks and only use baby wipes in between? Uh, do you enjoy working with other curious beings who likewise geek out over all things spacey? then it probably sounds like you belong in space. <laughs> Basically, what I'm trying to argue is, if you're comfortable in the hack space environment, you absolutely have a place in space. It's a psychological game. We're going to have to learn how to be a bit more communal. But our, view, our current visions of space exploration have to completely change if it's going to be a long game. So I want to thank you all from my Martian landscape down under. And hope you'll come visit me and explore the Aussie outback and enjoy Mars on Earth. And now I will take questions. I'm see more question than anything else. Uh, you mentioned microgravity experiments on the plants. Uh, how are you doing that within the confined space? Well, that's that, um, and I'll actually back up to it because I want you to see this. This is actually DIY hacked. Um, it's just a bit of value frame, really. Uh, got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, this guy here, if I can play the video again. It's just a, mm, there we go, just a few servo motors. Yep. It's really the algorithm um, yep. that's the most sophisticated part of this, which is also open source. So you can build your own microgravity simulator. Sitting in the back. 
Um, can you explain a little bit about what hydrogel is? Hydrogels. Okay. Anyone want to hazard a guess just by the, the etymology? Hydrogel. Basically, it's anything, it's a cellulosic material that's usually absorbent up to 90% water. So hyperabsorbent materials that form some sort of matrix, some sort of hemicellulosic matrix within that, that water suspension. Um, so highly hydrophilic, likes to absorb a lot of water, um, forms some sort of matrix that's stable so it doesn't dissolve. Um, and we'll kind of cover the basics of forming hydrogels and um, the, the chemistry of it, but essentially you're forming some sort of cross-link between these different mono so monomer to polymer, and then between the polymeric chains forming some sort of connection between them to create that stable matrix. Now, stable is, a, I'll say that in quotes, because they can be um, degradable within the body, so stable for maybe two weeks. What, co what could hydrogels be used for? What, what's that? What could hydrogels be used what for? What can they, oh my gosh, yeah, so that's another thing I've got a slide for in the workshop, but essentially hydrogels can be used for everything, everything. So when I say multimodal, I mean I'm aiming for in this environment to be used for food, for medicine, direct um, either sort of administering medicine, but also like um, long release, but also um, direct interventional, so tissue, reg regenerating tissue as well. Um, gosh, what else can you use it for? So many different things. Um, you can use it as an adhesive. Um, yeah, use it um, as a hyperabsorbent material, so putting it as a liner into different uh, diapers and other hygiene products. Yeah. Also great for cre uh, creating textiles. Yeah. So I've been working with DIY, DIY electro spinners um, and trying to scale that so you can create using this cellulosic material, creating textiles out of that using DIY electro spinners. Yeah. Hi, JJ. Hey. <laughs> um, what kind of technology needs to be created or discovered to enable biology off planet? Yeah. Yeah, look, I'm a huge fan of synthetic biology, but I think it's really got to get even more efficient. And um, I think humans need to stop consuming as much energy full stop. I think we need to work on our own meta metabolism a bit so that we're not consuming as much energy as organisms. So that's why I'm kind of advocating, like, we have to be engineered significantly before we can be even close to adaptable long for longevity off Earth. We're fine in like ISS for six months, a few years, but we're still within launch capabilities in ISS. Even Moon, like Mars is a, Mars is a different scope altogether. So yeah, uh, technology is really, we have to do human engineering. Yeah. Um, can you comment on kind of being with all of those people for two weeks, psychologically what that was yeah. like, and then after you left, did, were there any sort of psychological ramifications or observations? Oh my gosh. Yeah, look, the interesting part of that is really crew selection. And I think there's been so many, so many interesting studies in these analog environments. Um, particularly, I'll, I'd say anyone who's interested in, uh, in going into space long term should definitely look at um, different psychological studies of uh, crew that have done overwinters in Antarctica. So Concordia Station, there was a great study of three crew, uh, three different crew um, that had overwintered. Um, and this sort of psychological coping mechanism that they experienced in the six months overwintering in pretty much the same conditions that we had, you know, complete containment, recycled air, um, no outside communications really, um, just, you know, that crew of six to eight over six months. It's pretty intense. Um, we were on a two-week mission, you know, so that had its own challenges because we had to do a lot in two weeks. So really it was more of a um, negotiating that space intensely over the two weeks between six crew members. Um, but with these long durational missions, it's a psychological game, as in learning how to tolerate one another <laughs> um, with no return. There's, there's no going back. Um, if you're going off Earth to Mars, you're stuck with them um, till death you part. Uh, so definitely look into <laughs> definitely look into psych psychological studies from overwinters in Antarctica for a sort of hint 
into the, the psychological game that we'll have to have. Um, there are a number of interesting incidents um, of crews needing to kind of split the space to prevent assault. Um, of people coupling, I think Alex and I were talking about this the other day, of, of crew couplings. You know, what happens when you have crew members that pair up? Creates a little social awkwardness. Yeah, I mean, the other question, the, the Mars One crew have been asked um, to be completely abstinent. Can you be abstinent living off Earth and just being fine with that? Yeah, interesting sort of behavioral and cultural changes that we will have to address once we move off Earth. And once you left, you know. Once I left, we're all still very close. We're, we're actually good friends. There's something about that two-week mission that I think just kind of, it's trial by fire, and you learn how to cement um, your, your relationship by kind of enduring something together. So very different kind of mission experience than a longitudinal uh, mission. Yeah. So yeah. We found it kind of brought us together. There were definitely tensions, right? But all because of that sort of intensity of the mission. Um, over a long period of time, you've had enough time to kind of cycle through um, certain issues in many different forms. Yeah. Uh, what were the roles and responsibilities of the other crew members? Yeah. So. Um, our last Lunaris mission um, was a bit more close to the m uh, more traditional formalized roles. So I was mission specialist bioengineer. We had crew medic. There's usually some sort of crew medic, someone who's kind of designated to be the one that's keeping an eye on the health and well being and is like the go-to in case of emergency. Uh, commander and vice commander are kind of monitoring all the tasks. They're making sure that the whole mission, they've got the big eye on mission. Um, some sort of communication officer that's responsible for liaising with uh, Mishcom, making sure that everything's A-OK -okay back home. Um, let's see, there's so many different kind of roles, but I think what I'm trying to do on this next mission that I'm, I'm commanding is subverting that in a way, kind of flattening. Would you wanna live six months off Earth on Mars <laughs> with no real say? In, in what you're doing on there. I can understand if you're coming from um, a, a national program where you have very specific goals, um, or even a full research program, or if you're going from a, a corporation so it's becoming a company town, I think that's very likely to be the very first sort of base that we see on the moon is a, a company mission, mining or some other specific um, aim. Um, yeah, yeah, so the roles that we're gonna see going forward are gonna shift a bit um, and probably become a bit more corporatized. Uh, so you spoke a little bit about the uh, sort of the mindset uh, of the human and how the technology needs to adapt in order to become this sort of extraterrestrial, like you were talking about. What in the in a perfect world would that type of human look like, uh, or what would that society kind of look like? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I've heard this. It, we've had some interesting discussions, kind of within different people that are involved in these, you know, Mars formulations. Um, we were kind of joking about what the sort of perfect astronaut might be in different scenarios. If it's zero gravity, then probably shorter statured women, probably lesbians, um, who are just fine living in a cohort of women and not, <laughs> not needing to navigate other um, psychosexual <laughs> problems. Um, yeah, as for Mars, Moon, that's probably gonna be more determined by gravity. Um, the other thing I'll say about this, is that when you're living in this contained environment, it's a lot like living in a TARDIS. You have complete disorientation. I could have been living in some other universe in another dimension. You have no orientation, absolutely no orientation. And on the moon, you're remember, you're a satellite of a satellite. So your temporal experience on the moon is gonna be quite staggeringly different. Your circadian rhythm will have to be completely different. Mars is slightly closer um, to our 24 hour um, soul, um, but still, uh, sun daylight is much weaker. Um, you will never see natural UV light again. You will always be in some sort of contained 
vehicle, either an EVA suit or your contained space. So no more sun on the skin, no more outside natural wind on the skin, um, no more smelling anything from the outdoors. Everything is going to be mediated um, off Earth. So perhaps I'll close by saying I think that gives us a bit more perspective on just how special this particular planet is and how well adapted our senses are to it. So thank you. Thank you.